All right, well, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation 6. Revelation 6. And uh, we've just had an exciting time here in the book of the Revelation. It's not Revelations, it's Revelation. So it's the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of St. John the Divine or anybody else. It's Jesus showing us himself and giving us a message as well about what's going to take place in the future and why we as Christians have reason to be hopeful as we look forward. In chapter 4 of Revelation, we started talking about the hereafter. And we see uh, John brought up into the throne room of God, amazing throne room. And uh, in that throne room, we see a book in chapter number 5. It's actually probably a scroll. And that scroll has seven seals on it. No one's found worthy to open up this scroll. Well, what is this scroll? Well, it's the revelation of what's going to happen. And so John's all tore up, but then one steps out from the right hand of the Father, and that is the Lamb of God, the uh, Root of David, the uh, Lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he steps out, he takes the scroll, and all of the throne room goes wild. The saints, the angels, the seraphim, they all just go wild, singing and praising God. And uh, we see in uh, chapter 6, as this is where we're at, the seal is open. The first chapter is read. And we see a, a, a man on a white horse. And uh, this is the, the Antichrist. This is the one who opposes Christ in the end times. He promises peace and prosperity, but yet what does he deliver in verses 3 and 4? War. War. That's right, the red horse of war. Verses 5 and 6, what does he deliver? Famine. Famine is on the earth, and therefore there's poverty. And with war, and with poverty and famine, verses 7 and 8, what is the, last, the fourth thing we see here, the fourth horse? Death. Death, that's right. And so, as we talked about that, uh, we went to verse number 9. And uh, this is where we're going to start today. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And so here we have this false Messiah promising peace and prosperity. And we see war. We see famine and poverty. We see death, widespread death. One-fourth of the world dying. It's a lot of people dead. And who does he blame? It's Christians. The Christians. He blames the people of the book, the Christians, the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, with all this happening, exactly like Revelation says it's going to happen, there are probably some people during the tribulation who are going to find some old Bibles and dust them off. Maybe they'll find them in an old abandoned church building somewhere. And they're going to say, this is going exactly according to the book. <laughs> and then they read the end of the book, and they see that Christ is victorious. They read the beginning of the book, which says that Christ died for their sins. And uh, they, they trust Christ. They become Christ followers. And uh, because the person pulling the strings of this man of sin, the son of perdition, is Satan. You know, Satan wants to always destroy God's people. Whether it's the Jews in the book of Esther and under Hitler, or whether it's the Christians, he wants to destroy God's people. And so we see here, uh, let's go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. We like to compare what Jesus says in Matthew 24 with what's going on here in Revelation 6. And Matthew 24 makes for a great study. In verses 3 through 8 of Matthew 24, we see false Christ coming on the scene. We see wars and rumors of wars. We see uh, pestilence, famine. And it says these are the beginning of sorrow. But then in verse number 9, we see the martyrdom here. It says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. 
And because of iniquity, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The word saved means delivered. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And so we see here martyrdom. Christians being placed to death. And then we're going to see in chapter 7, we're not going to get there today, but we're going to see the, the gospel one last time going throughout the entire world and people getting saved. In verse number 9 it says, under the altar. What is the altar? Let's turn back to Exodus 29. Exodus 29. I think there's a picture that we're seeing here. And by the way, this is not just something that happens at the end of time. A ruler promising peace and prosperity and instead bringing war and then poverty comes and death and God's people get blamed for it. That's something that's happened throughout all of history. But this is just at the end times there's going to be an intensification of this. And here they are being put to death, and there they are under the altar. Look at Exodus 29, verses 10 through 12. It says, And thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. Thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. So here's a bullock being sacrificed and the blood of that bullock is poured where? At the bottom of the altar. Uh, it is put on the, uh, on the horns of the altar but it's also poured at the bottom of the altar. Look at Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus 4, verses 4 through 7. It says here, And he shall bring the bullock into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head, and shall kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So as we think about the sacrifice of this bullock, you know, putting the blood on the horns of the incense altar, pouring the blood underneath the altar there at the tabernacle and later the temple. And then when we see these people being put to death for the faith, and it says, And I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, I think what we see here is that when the Christians are put to death throughout history, remember this is written to a persecuted church, and when Christians are put to death at the end of times, what is that to the Lord? It's a sweet-smelling sacrifice made unto God. And so one day, if some of you who are younger live in a place or they say, deny Christ, or be put to death. And you have to make that choice. Remember that the ultimate sacrifice you can give for the Lord, or to the Lord, is of yourself. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, tells us to be a living sacrifice. We ought to be giving our bodies on the altar every day for the Lord. But sometimes in history, and especially during this period called the tribulation, for those who are 
getting saved, for those who are converted during that time, many are going to be called upon, if not most, to give their lives as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to their Lord. Let's go on. Verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They cried with a loud voice. Charles Alexander says this. He says, So long as righteous blood remains unavenged, there is an unsatisfied demand on divine and holy justice. And so these aren't vengeful people being put to death. But it's just like Abel. You know, Abel's blood, it said, cried out from the ground against Cain, his brother, who had killed him. It doesn't mean that literally the blood is speaking. <laughs> but what it's saying here is, as you see that blood soaking into the ground, that blood is demanding vengeance. Because whoever sheds man's blood, the Bible says, by man shall his blood be shed. It's up to governments who bear the sword to put to death those who are murderers. Because people are created in the image of God. And so when you put a person to death, it's as if you're taking a picture of God and destroying it. And that's serious. And so here we have government <laughs> killing people because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as their blood is shed, that blood is crying out, when are you going to make them pay for what they have done to your people, Lord? And whether it's in the Middle East somewhere, whether it's in Africa somewhere, or whether it's in China somewhere, or India, or wherever it may be that Christians are persecuted and even put to death, God is going to get vengeance or take vengeance on those who have mistreated and hurt God's people. Now, if someone kills a Christian, can that person be saved? Well, Paul was. Saul became Paul. Because someone has to pay for killing God's people, especially. And so Saul, who became Paul, was converted on the road to Damascus. And who paid for that sin of him killing Christians? Jesus on the cross. You understand how that works? Someone is going to pay for our sins. But there's one sin that God particularly uh, does justice about. And that is with his people are being mishandled and mistreated and put to death. And the blood is crying out with a loud voice how long? How long? But you know what? It's not our responsibility to get vengeance. It's not our responsibility as individuals to enact retribution on those who are mistreating us. Whose duty is it to get vengeance and to enact justice? God's. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19. All we're doing here is putting God's principles into play in the end times. Romans 12, beginning verse 17. Recompense or repay to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as lieth in you, Live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, 
but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So God is going to uh, give justice where justice is due in this situation where his people are wrongfully being put to death. So here's the question that the blood of these saints cries out. And that is in verse number 10, How long, O Lord, <laughs> you're holy, you're true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And you know, as John is writing this to a persecuted church, some who are being persecuted are probably asking the same question. How long are you going to allow this injustice to go on? This is a common phrase, how long? Look at Psalm 13, verse 1. Psalm 13, verse 1. The psalmist says this, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? Psalm 89, verse 46. says here, How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? This is the cry of those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. How long are you going to let this keep going on? In our nation today, we think about the unborn children who are being killed. Innocent children being killed through abortion. How long, O oh Lord? And you know, based on God's word, that when innocent blood is shed, God is going to enact judgment. And unless we repent as a nation and cast that sin upon Christ, unless there's revival, there is going to be judgment for that sin. Okay, but what happened to these people who were killed for the sake of Christ? Verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. White robes were given unto every one of them. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So here they are, being killed for the faith. Boo. The moment after, who are they with? They're with Christ. And boo, they now are dressed in white robes. Chapter 3 of Revelation. It's interesting, the, the, the uniform of heaven is mentioned quite a bit. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. It says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Chapter 4, verse 4. It says, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Upon these seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. What is this white raiment? We'll look at chapter 19. We'll take a sneak peek. Revelation 19, verse 8. And to her, and this is to the bride of Christ, to the church, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, Clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So the righteousness of the saints, the righteousness of Christ, is what they'll be clothed with. Boo. 
They're going to be okay. I like what John R. Rice said. He said if someone ever threatened to kill him, he'd say, what are you doing? Are you threatening to kill me with heaven? <laughs> I mean, are you threatening me with heaven? You know, I mean, for, for Christians, you know, here you are, you're faced with that moment. And I believe that in that moment, the Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says, will tell you what to say in that moment. And the Holy Spirit of God who lives within you will give you the strength to say, I will not deny my Lord. And here it is, the beauty of studying the Bible. We know that the moment they put you to death, you're with Christ. And you'll be okay. And you'll have that white raiment on in heaven, which represents the righteousness of Christ that you already have here on earth. And there's a big wedding that's coming where you are going to be joined with Christ forever and ever. And if you endure until the end, there is deliverance. If you deny Christ, though, then that's a sign the Holy Spirit doesn't live within you. And, and Jesus says, if you deny me before men, then one day I'm going to deny you before the Father. It doesn't mean that denying Christ is a work for salvation. But it simply means the Holy Spirit will give you the grace that you need and the strength to do what's right in that hour when you're confronted with denying the Lord. And verse 11 says, White robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest, yet for a little season, unto their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. That's what heaven is. It's rest. And when you've been persecuted like some of these folks are that this letter is going to, and when you've been persecuted like these Christians are here in the book of the Revelation, then you're going to long for that time of rest with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says here, rest for a little season until all of the people that I've appointed to be a sacrifice unto me with their lives until all of them have been put to death as well. You know, last week was Father's Day and we sing that hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. And it's talking mainly about spiritual forefathers. But one of the lines in that song says, what an honor it would be. This is not how the line goes, but this is what it means. What an honor it would be if like many of our forefathers, spiritual forefathers, we were to be put to death as well for the cause of Christ. That used to be seen as a badge of honor. It doesn't mean that you go throwing yourself at the death squad, but it does mean when you end up in that situation, you're like, wow, I get to follow my Lord not only in life, but I get to follow him in death as well. And you know the moment after, you're going to be in his presence for all of eternity, free from this sin-cursed world. Any thoughts about this great martyrdom that's going to take place during this tribulation period? All right. Well, like I said, you always bring yourself upon yourself the anger and judgment of God when you start messing with his people. Okay? And that's what we see here as we go to verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. So here it is. You know, the, the sixth chapter of this book has been opened. And lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed, as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island was moved out of their places. What do we see in this sixth seal? We see divine judgment. You're messing with the apple of my eye. <laughs> You're messing with my people. And I am going to pour out my judgment in an even greater measure. Look at Matthew 24, 29. 
Remember Matthew 24, Jesus reveals a lot of the same things he's revealing here in Revelation. Matthew 24, verse number 29. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. A little sneak preview in verse 30. And then shall appear. <laughs> so the Son of Man is near, right? Jesus' coming in glory is near. But it's not yet. Everything is shaken up. Look at Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13. We, see, we read of these days. Isaiah 13. Verses 6 through 13. says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint. Every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold on them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth, giving birth. They shall be amazed one in another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their sin and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And we're seeing this take place in Revelation chapter 6. We go on to Isaiah 34, verses 1 through 4. Isaiah 34, verses 1 through 4. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people, let the earth hear and all that is therein the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come out out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Here it is. Overripe figs on a fig tree. The wind blows through, and what happens to the overripe figs? They fall off. <laughs> the leaves are coming off the trees. God's wind of judgment is about to blow. And we see that in verses 13 through 15 of Revelation, or excuse me, verses 12 through 14 of Revelation chapter 6. So what do people do? Whenever God sends his judgment, it's for the purpose of warning people that they need to repent. So is that the, what the world system and the world is going to do? No. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Instead of getting right with this God of power, what do they try to do? Hide from God's judgment. You know what they say, you can run, but you can't hide. 
And that's especially true when God's judgment pours out. And we see, and, and said to the mountains, this is what they're saying, and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, his anger, and who shall be able to stand? You know, the amazing thing is, at this point, the world knows exactly what's happening, that God is pouring out on his, his judgment on them. And yet, what does this world do? <laughs> Refuses to repent. But you know what? What did I say? God's judgment. It always comes to give people another chance to get right with him. And in chapter number 7, when we pick up there next week, we're going to see a great revival in this world. Perhaps like never before. We're going to see God calling preachers to go forth and proclaim his gospel through all the earth. And we're going to see multitudes coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ because of this terrible judgment that God's bring forth upon the world.